Bienvenue. Welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great privilege and pleasure to welcome our live audience and also our virtual audience to this great uh, event. I want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on indigenous land, the land of the Yoronwandat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. It's actually the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land. This is a good thing to say if we're going to be talking about uh, climate change and the environment, and also the great privilege that we all have to continue to do our work here. So I am going to introduce uh, Professor and Senior Fellow uh, Jennifer Jenkins. She's a member of uh, the board of Massey College. She's been organizing these senior lecture series for a few years. I want to thank her for all the great work that she's done. She's also a, a specialist in European history, particularly Germany. Uh, we've had a, the occasion to hear her speaking about uh, several books on the uh, biographies of Ang Angela Merkel. So uh, thank you very much, and Jennifer, for continuing to do this great work. Merci. Thank you so much, Natalie. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you to everyone who's come here today. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy to be introducing Diane Sachs. Let me put my glasses on. One second. <laughs> there we go. Um, Diane Sachs, who's a senior fellow of this college, she is one of Canada's most respected environmental lawyers. She has a Clean 50 Award, a Law Society Medal, and many other awards. She was the very popular Environmental Commissioner of Ontario reporting to the Legislature on Environment, Energy, and Climate. She now heads, she now heads Sachs Facts, hosts the Green Economy Heroes podcast. There's a long list of accomplishments here. She's the deputy leader of the Ontario Green Party. She is herself a Green Party candidate in the University of Rosedale Riding and, and I said, a Massey College Senior Fellow. So I'm going to turn it over to Diane, who will introduce our panelists. You have. Okay, pardon me. Hello, everybody. We haven't had this big an audience um, in person because we've mostly been connected online. So, uh, a year ago, people asked for a Nassau Committee party and I to do a series of. Series of Whoops. Okay, is that better? Yeah. 
Yes? Hello? One, two, one, maybe. I don't speak up that much, but I'll try. <laughs> um, right. Anyway, so we're going to be talking about how Massey can play a role in convening conversations that actually reduce barriers. We all know what the problems are at this point. There's lots and lots and lots of evidence of the problems. We only have to look at British Columbia this year if we need more, more evidence. Um, so now the question is, how do we make the solutions go faster? Can we, in fact, run faster as disaster gets closer? So that's what we're hoping for next year. But in the meantime, we're having one last conversation, and uh, public conversation, and it's here, and it's about the role of cities. And we know that in Canada, most people live in cities. Most of the emissions come from cities. Well, a very large part of the emissions come from cities. And most of the opportunities are in cities. And municipal governments can influence about half of the emissions that take place in cities and therefore have a really important role. They are hamstrung in many ways by the constitutional crisis, by the lack of resources. I'm sure you've all heard the stats that of every dollar of tax revenue, municipalities get less than 10 cents. So there's many, many problems that municipalities face, but they also have a tremendously important role. So we have three people. Um, we have with us today Gabby Kalipos here in person from the Clean Air Partnership, um, who's been working on good, well, we just lost the screen again, <laughs> working on good public policy and, and supporting particularly municipalities in Ontario. Um, and online, maybe, if we're still lucky, Yes, there's somebody yep. up there. Okay, good. Not on our picture, but over there. That's great. Oh, here they come. Uh, two wonderful people doing great work on this. One is uh, Matt Gemmel from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, um, which is managing a more than billion dollar green municipal fund provided by the federal government to get money to municipalities so they could actually get stuff done. Um, and we have Rick Lochtenberg in British Columbia in Nelson, BC, who took the initiative to start a peer-to-peer -peer network of municipal councillors and mayors right across the country. It's called the Climate Caucus, so that councillors can support each other to get things done. And in many cases, and when we know that most Canadians feel sort of helpless and alone on climate, most Canadians feel that other people don't care as much as they do. Well, this is on steroids for municipal councillors who are often elected in places where they don't hear other people speaking up and feel very much alone and have found uh, colleagues, resources, advice, energy, enthusiasm through Rick's uh, Climate Caucus. So that's uh, basically where we're starting. And I think I said, I wrote all this out, and I think I said that I was going to start with Matt. And Matt, you're going to give us, whoops, you're going to give us an overview of what Canadian municipalities are doing about climate, um, who the leaders are, and how you're helping. Five minutes. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks very much, Dan. Can you hear me okay? Great, good, good to see you. Well, uh, thanks so much for, for the invitation uh, to join you. I'm uh, coming to you from uh, Ottawa on the uh, traditional and unceded uh, land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nations. And uh, it's great to have a chance to, to share the virtual stage with Clean Air Partnership and the Climate Caucus. Our three organizations work together fairly regularly, but aren't often in a, in a uh, you know, have an opportunity like this to, to talk bigger picture about the role of municipalities. So I uh, appreciate Dr. Sachs uh, inviting us uh, all, all together to have this conversation. Um, FCM, um, just for, for all of your benefit, is the, is the national voice of municipal governments in Canada, and we've been uh, playing that role since, since 1904. Um, and we're very involved in the conversation about the role of, of municipal governments um, when it comes to climate change uh, at the federal level in two ways. Um, we play a direct programmatic role, uh, which Dr. Sachs mentioned uh, at the outset, uh, notably with our Green Municipal Fund, uh, which is uh, an endowment that the federal government created in, in the year 2000. Uh, to fund uh, plans and studies and capital projects uh, that are reducing emissions. But we also play that role, and, and my, my direct uh, involvement is more on the federal uh, advocacy side. And so uh, we have uh, an ongoing conversation that I'll, I'll talk with you uh, a bit about today uh, around uh, the partnership, uh, the intergovernmental collaboration between orders of government um, to uh, achieve uh, the, the climate goals that we have and, uh, and make the progress on, on climate that we, we so urgently need to. 
Um, just a, maybe a little, a little bit uh, of, uh, of, a, of a quick overview of uh, FCM's role at, in, in Glasgow in the recent uh, COP conference, uh, just given the, the series that, uh, that this conversation is, uh, is part of. Uh, so COP was, uh, was represented there by the, the chair of our Big City Mayor's Caucus, who is currently Mayor Mike Savage from Halifax, along with um, FCM CEO Carol Saab. Um, and, and the conversation there, just to, to give you a, a sense of sort of the role of municipal governments on the international stage, uh, was to work with our international uh, city network counterparts from around the world. So for instance, the Umbrella Global Organization, UCLG, the Union of uh, Cities and Local Governments, uh, or our American counterparts, the US Conference of Mayors, um, or our, our UK counterparts, the Local Government Association, um, who are all working with their, uh, at the national level, with their national and federal governments um, and state uh, governments uh, around, in conversations around the role of local governments, um, creating intergovernmental mechanisms for that kind of cooperation, calling for more ambitious um, action and, and commitments through um, through the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs that national governments submit um, to the UN. Um, and that, that's a, that's an exciting conversation on the on, on the global stage. Um, there's also a, a series of uh, or a whole uh, network really of um, city networks that are focused on climate action. That that uh, and you'll be aware of many of them, like C40, the Global Covenant of Mayors, etc. The, uh, in terms of COP, um, you know, one of the things that wasn't really covered was a small change to the wording that happened in the last day of negotiations that FCM and, and our international city network counterparts were part of, uh, which was to ensure that there was wording like there was in the Paris Agreement in the, in the Glasgow Climate Pact uh, that clearly outlines the role for um, state and local subnational uh, governments uh, and the need for, for partnerships among uh, order of governments. And so it's a, it's a small uh, you know, change uh, that wasn't there in the draft that made it into the final, but, but it is important in that it reflects the progress that we've seen at least since the, the, the Paris Climate Agreement that this isn't national governments doing this on their own. There has to be uh, a multi-level a multi -level, um, effort amongst orders of government uh, and of course collaboration with the, with the private sector. So we're really glad to, to see that. In the Canadian context, and I know Gabriella and, and Rick will, will speak more about this, I think, you know, we're, there was a whole phase of, you know, municipal climate action sort of 1.0. I mean, we, we founded our Partners for Climate Protection program and I think 1995, if I have that right, uh, you know, cities have been at this and, 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 and you know, uh, pushing for, for more action, setting ambitious targets for a long time. But, but we're really in a new phase now, I think, with something like, you know, over 500 now municipal governments having declared climate emergencies, most notably. I think recently the city of Calgary. Um, and so there's this sort of renewed um, sense of, of urgency and, and momentum because municipalities are, are dealing with the effects uh, on, on the ground in a very real and, and, and tragic way as we're seeing play out um, in, in BC. Um, in, in recent years, I think we're seeing, um, uh, in, in my view, um, a, a very substantial and exciting um, level of collaboration um, and partnership and, and coordination between the federal government and municipal governments. Though it's not, to, to sort of put my you know, political science hat on, not of a, of, a, of a formal institutional nature, sort of like we saw between the federal government and, and the provinces and territories through the Pan-Canadian framework. It's more of a, what I guess what I describe as a pr pragmatic or a programmatic kind of a partnership. And there's many of examples of this. Uh, I think you know, one that, that I just wanna highlight quickly is, is around public transit, where we've seen um, significant and, 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 and uh, tangible commitments um, in the last year that are linked directly to the federal government's climate action plan. Um, one is $2.7 billion for trans electrification. Another is um, a long-term funding commitment uh, through a mechanism that FCM proposed under the title the Permanent Transit Fund that will really allow cities to build long-term around uh, public transit. So that's the nature of the, uh, of the kind of partnership we're seeing, which I think is, is exciting and is important. In the interest of time, I'm just going to list four other areas where I think we need to see more uh, action, and I won't go into details. And maybe we can come come back to, to those details, but and, and they won't surprise anybody. But it's you know within transportation, buildings, uh, waste, and then you know broadly this category of sort of just transition or the the you know impact uh, and the equity considerations on communities on a regional basis. Those are our four four big priorities, and there there's a series of recommendations we have to the federal government within those four areas, and be happy to come back uh, to to those and, and speak more a little bit more about uh, where we think we need to go together in, in those areas. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, 
Gabby, so I, I mean, I know municipalities have been talking about climate action for a long time, and some useful things have been done for sure. But we also see sprawl continuing to explode. We we see municipalities get to the brink of making a good decision and then losing their nerve, like Vancouver on their um, uh, finally eliminating free parking, the city of Toronto even on the rooming houses. And so over and over, when push actually comes to shove, climate action doesn't happen. So are we going to see that change? I mean, what, what do you see happening in the real world? So I definitely think that's going to change. Right. Um, I think that there's a fair amount of education that needs to take place and helping people and municipal councillors make the linkage between the decision they're making at that moment in time in council and the climate implications associated with it. Um, if I can just backtrack a little bit on this one. Oh, I sorry, expect, you, no, 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 explain, go right ahead. Explain to the cleaner yeah. partnership. I didn't do that. No, no. Um, so uh, the Clean Air Partnership, we're a charitable environmental organization, and we work with municipalities to help them implement clean air and climate change actions. And I thought I'd give you a little bit of a kind of uh, a journey on what is municipal climate action look like? Like what, how does a municipality approach their need to identify where their levers for change are within climate change? And Matt was raising, a, uh, Matt set me up for the segue um, actually beautifully in, in the sense of keep you an idea, really the first thing a municipality does is they identify where their emissions are coming from. And there's pretty standard def, like uh, uh, where their emissions are coming from in the many different, uh, in the same, in across jurisdictions. So ultimately the first thing is they have to get their own municipal house in order. How are their facilities generating the energy that they need? How much efficiency is there associated with their own facilities? What kind of things are they doing within their fleets? What kind of procurement practices they have? So that's the kind of more kind of just structural kind of changes that a municipality needs to make to get their own house in order to be able to um, act on their climate change opportunities. Then when they're, um, that, that often accounts for somewhere between three to eight percent of a community's emissions, depending on whether they run transit or run the waste kind of facility. So it would be higher in that, it, you know, if they run the foot transit and the waste facilities. But ultimately what it comes down to is municipalities develop these climate action plans that are in place that address where the emissions are coming from within their municipalities. And it's pretty standard. It's always coming from buildings, transportation and waste that will account for it and as you can imagine a municipality has huge influences in terms of where housing is built the requirements that they put onto it um, how the transit how land use is planned um, how transit is actually delivered and the waste uh, management within the community so these are great opportunities for municipalities to use their influence to address the climate implications associated with providing these services and um, and managing how their communities are built i will give a little bit of the sense of like why haven't we made more progress after 25 years, we're still Why talking are we about still? the same things. Really, when it comes down to it, these, these areas are actually quite challenging. And I think one of the most important things that Matt was raising on this one is that a climate change has raised a lot more awareness amongst the national governments in terms of their role in setting the system or the structure for how their country is going to act on climate change. Then there's the provinces who actually are the ones who run municipalities in the sense that they make the rules for what municipalities can and cannot do. That's not the federal government that does that. That's the provincial governments in Canada that do that. So what we really need to have happen in order for us to truly accelerate the action that we need to, because we've been stalling for far too long, is we need to have national governments, provincial governments, and municipal governments all rowing in the same direction, all supporting each other's initiatives to truly ramp up where we need to go and what we need to achieve. I'll give you an example in terms of home retrofits. So I'll just advance in my, on my time. Go ahead. Okay. I'll give an example of home retrofits. You could say like absolutely nothing stopping any of us from doing a deep energy efficiency retrofit, getting natural gas out of our homes and moving into electricity for providing our energy needs. But you can imagine if you were tasked with that, figure it out. How are you going to do that? It's a it's a pretty big challenge for an average homeowner to figure out how are they going to move and do this energy efficiency retrofit and get you know move move towards uh, getting fossil fuels out of their home. 
we have to provide supports to homeowners to be able to do this. So we have to develop programs. These programs cost money to develop. And yes, we've had it in Ontario where you can get some energy efficiency in from utility programs, but it's those types of programs are not going to cut it for the level of ambition we need to set for ourselves in terms of getting these programs. So right now, FCM has got a community efficiency financing that was funded by the federal government to help municipalities with the startup and administration costs for getting these retrofit programs into their community and helping homeowners navigate the complex world of undertaking an energy efficiency retrofit. It's these programs that we have to get into market and then scale them up and grow them and create policies that drive people to these, mar these programs, such as home energy labeling, that will change the ecosystem that we need to build to build a conducive and supportive environment for people to take action in their areas of influence. Right, and if anyone's interested in that, in our last panel, we had Alex Chapman here uh, to talk about property assessed clean energy financing, particularly how municipalities can unlock uh, a wave of retrofits and what kind of funding support they need to make all that happen. But it would create hundreds of thousands of jobs. It's a really great idea. We know how to do it. We're just not doing it. Um, Rick, are you? I hope you're still there. First of all, are you okay? I mean, we hear only bad news from BC these days. Are you guys all right? Yeah, we're we're where I'm at in Nelson. We're just outside of the. Uh... The, the main disaster areas. and uh, But as a province, we're certainly reeling from the effects of that uh, atmospheric river and another one coming. So yeah, climate change has been really real here in BC. And I think part of the reason why we've been on the forefront of action is, is because we felt the effects maybe earlier than the rest of the country. Um, there's also, you know, a, a cultural, um, uh, a, a bit of a cultural difference here potentially than the rest of the country given our um, sort of distance from, from Ottawa and maybe some of the status quo uh, thinking that's uh, dominated and slowed us from taking really concrete action. At least that's what but I tell it, myself. Yeah. Nelson, <laughs> Nelson is a gorgeous place, but um, yeah. anyway, I'm glad you're okay. And I hope that people recover as quickly as possible, but tell us about the climate caucus. I mean, I, I think it's such a wonderful innovation. I'm delighted to support it when I can but I don't know if anybody here knows about it. So tell us about the Climate Caucus. So the Climate Caucus is now in its, it's two years old um, and it's grown to almost 500 mayors and councillors from uh, across the country focused on climate action. And like you said in your introduction, the one of the goals or the focuses of Climate Caucus is to empower individual elected uh, leaders particularly those elected people in uh, areas that um, are less sort of progressive or less inclined for climate action. So we have, we've done a lot and, and help uh, councillors in the city of Calgary, for example, Edmonton, Regina, um, throughout the, the, the prairies and, and, and across the country where there are maybe one or two councillors that are really focused on climate action and, and have felt isolated and, and alone and so not only do we give them sort of join with them in some sort of solidarity, but we do feed them a lot of information and ideas on how to move action in a council that might not be, um, uh, you know, ready for it or, or, or understand the, the uh, importance of, of climate action. Um, so and, and beyond that, too, I just want to say we've really expanded our, our, our view to, to look at um, things that are working uh, in municipalities around the country and then make sure that that, that is being shared as, as broadly and as effectively as possible. I think one of the things that has slowed us down uh, from taking action over the last 25 years has been the lack of an innovation culture. And, and by that, I mean that within, say, the tech sector, we understand that innovation works um, largely based on the willingness to fail. But that's kind of an anathema for, for governments. They want to only place your bets. But if we're going to innovate quickly, we need to accept that, let's say, the city of Nelson has to do at least one or two things that are have a really high chance of failure and then be willing and understand that they're doing that on behalf of sort of the collective, the, on behalf of the whole country. Um, an example of that, for example, is we've, we've had the opportunity to... Um, 
launch a, uh, a, a composting program. And we knew that, and we, we had the consultants come in and, and they came in and said, okay, well, this is the way it typically works. And we asked the question right away, well, okay, if that's the way it typically works, is there an opportunity to do something different that, that, you know, let's take a big swing and see if we can do something bigger, um, knowing that there's a good chance it would fail. And, and so we pursued a program that was quite a bit different from the typical windrow, you know, curbside pickup the weekly curbside pickup, which we saw was, you know, it seemed quite inefficient. You know, you're doing a, a weekly pickup and right now in a diesel, a big diesel truck, and and then we're shipping it off to the composting facility, which is almost 50 kilometers out of the city. It seemed like there's gotta be a chance that there's a better way. And so that's what, I won't go into details on the program, but it's it's something that we're really pursuing, knowing that it might fail, but if it works, we're going to quickly share that information with the rest of the country. And I think that's one of the, the, the ways we can accelerate action and really use the power of a distributed network, which is inherently what we have in, amongst municipalities to accelerate action. Right. And you didn't mention the handbook. So one of the things that they, I mean, two of the things that I, that I've noticed in addition to just people supporting each other is that the network really provides resources, practical resources, mm -hmm always every every month at least one really good useful speaker uh with mm -hmm. a lot of resources and a handbook that's been put together so that any municipal elected can look up what's a state-of-the-art policy on this that or the other so yeah, that's right. and I, go ahead. I just want to add in addition to that handbook we've also got a second handbook for young people that we put together with the youth climate lab called the infiltration manual and that idea was how do we help all of those young passionate activists be more effective at pushing their local government to change, even helping to share, you know, how local government works. So if they want to run themselves for, for council or, or even for mayor, they can do it with confidence and, and be more effective. Oh, an infiltration manual. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about success stories. I mean, Matt, what's your favorite municipal success story on climate? Well, there's, there's a lot um, at the, at the small scale. I think the theme, you know, and one of the, one of the, I think, um, you know, key messages we're going to deliver today is like, you know, we need to take those experiments that Rick was talking about. And I totally agree about the, the hesitancy to, uh, to take risks, but where we had, where there are success stories, you know, sharing those through networks like the climate caucus, uh, FCM plays that role as well. Clean air partnership does in Ontario, um, to, to replicate them, um, and then to, you know, accelerate that action and to scale up. And that's, I think where our, our, our federal advocacy comes in, but to, to pick an example, I think of on not, not of a, of a, of a, of a particular project, like there's some, there's some cool projects around, uh, city of Richmond using, you know, um, waste heat from a sewer main in a wastewater treatment plant for a district energy system. Really cool. Uh, Saint Hyacinth uh, outside of uh, Montreal using um, uh, partnering with the egg sector to use yogurt waste, basically yogurt manufacturing waste, dairy waste uh, to create biogas to uh, power uh, municipal uh, fleet vehicles, including garbage collection. So it's so it's not the diesel trucks picking up the compost, it's uh, it's trucks running on renewable natural gas. There's a lot of really cool projects like that at, at the local level. But I think the one I, I wanted to, to highlight is uh, the city of Montreal's climate plan, because I think it it, the, the focus it has on on nature and natural infrastructure, on tree planting, on parks, um, is I think particularly important and something that we're starting to see more of and are going to see a, a lot more of in, in the future, um, because it has both a climate resiliency uh, aspect to it, um, as well as a, a carbon sequestration um, aspect to it. But it has such a, a real tangible quality of life impact uh, for residents that there's a lot of momentum and support for that, and, and there has was just reelected, you know, on 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 a, on a platform, um, you know, of continuing a climate action uh, along along those lines. There's there's great actions there around public transit and active transportation uh, and building retrofits, but it, but it's that natural infrastructure element uh, at the parks and the tree planting piece in in, in Montreal that that stands out for me. Okay, Gabby, you talked about how wonderful it would be if everybody just 
we're had the moving. same objective, but we're working together. While we're waiting for that, um, how do we, I mean, how can, municipalities are so hamstrung by the provincial governments, as we saw with the decision about Doug Ford's cutting the, the um, Toronto Council in half in the middle of, a, of an election, it was still upheld. Um, how can municipalities actually be more effective, given that we now have hostile provincial governments in the, all the big polluting provinces? Well, there's plenty of areas of spheres of influence that they have that they can act on immediately while they're waiting for authorities and uh, resources to be able to act in other areas and changing the system, which is actually the systemic changes that we need to make. Those are not often in the hands of municipalities. That would be more in the hands of provincial and federal governments in terms of the systems. But while that kind of change in systems is 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 hopefully making accelerating progress. Uh, let's hope for that. You're, you're um, such an optimist. I know okay, I am. An, I am a, a naive optimist. <laughs> um, I'd say that there's certainly lots of areas where municipalities have all the authorities in the world to be able to influence and make the decisions that they need to make. I'll use an example. A lot of times, municipalities are developing their corporate energy plans for what they're going to do with their buildings. And most of the times, those corporate energy plans were identifying reductions, but they were not in line with their climate emergency declarations. And as such, those corporate energy plans need to become in alignment with their climate emergency direct, uh, 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 climate emergency declarations. As such, they really, when you're looking at this, you're identifying how are we going to use our asset management renewal to be able to move our buildings towards the destination that they need to be, which is no fossil fuel, no emissions. How do we turn these inefficient fossil fuel using buildings into non-fossil fuel efficient buildings. Right. And so they look at their asset managements and they kind of identify when there's going to be switch outs and they've got to need to do that. Okay, so, so who's actually doing that? Gabby? So there's our, is there, are no, there are municipalities. For example, Toronto's built three um, net zero emission buildings just recently. There's a number of other municipalities that are doing um, uh, business plans and um, feasibilities to advance them towards the end, not, not, no um, zero emission buildings. So there's progress taking place on that one. It does require changes in the way they do their, their analysis of what does this cost. And they're looking at it like minis many municipalities had a rule that we don't do actions unless they're paid back within eight years. And these initiatives are going to take 10 to 15 years to pay themselves back. And as, as such, they make they save the money over the lifetime of the asset, but they just need to have the upfront capital to invest in it. And these things are possible to happen. And many municipalities are making progress in that direction. However, we know it's not at the scale that it needs to be in order to move this forward. But as one of the key things that we need to do is each municipality is advancing their clean air and climate change action. They need to share what they're doing with all the other municipalities. And then we need to kind of hold them to account. If one of you can do it, why aren't all of you doing it? And all of you should be able to do it. And if there's issues and barriers that you're facing, then we had to all work together with municipal governments, provincial governments, and federal governments to address the systemic challenges that they're facing to move away from planning another climate action plan to actual implementation of the actions and programs that we need to get into market to help Canadians reduce their fossil fuel use and address their climate challenges. Okay. Um, Rick, mm -hmm. there so much. Hi. So, can you tell us a success story from the network? You've put a boatload of time into building this network. Um, what keeps you going? I mean, what do you see working that excites you? Well, I want to brag about the city of Nelson for a bit, actually, because we, uh, the city of Nelson, has set a target of seventy-five percent reductions by 2030, which is pretty much certainly the most aggressive targets in the country, possibly among the most aggressive targets in the world. And to um, support that target, we've also hired and have now seven and a half full-time staff dedicated to that climate action plan. For, for context, that would be the equivalent of the city of Toronto having 1,300 full-time climate staff. So, okay, setting the benchmark. Good job. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, but it's not just about hiring staff. The city of Nelson also has, and I think we're in our eighth year of running a deep retrofit program. We have a 
um, a, a, an entire lab dedicated to, called our Nest Lab, dedicated to social innovation. And I think I'll just take a pause there and speak about social innovation just for a second, because I think this is something that cities really can take leadership on, and the city of Nelson is doing that. So we, um, running our own energy retrofit program, ran into a couple of issues that we experienced that are going to be the same issues that will be faced as we try to roll out energy retrofit around the country. The first was getting people to sign up. It was a struggle. We got the early adopters, that was good, but then it's, we seemed to run into a wall. Uh, even among people that said they, they felt climate was one of their top issues, still weren't taking the leap and retrofitting their homes. And so what we did was we experimented with a couple of things. One of them was offering and rolling into our ret energy, home retrofit program, e-bikes. We said we will finance up to $8,000 a purchase of one, two, or even more e-bikes for your home, you'll put it onto your hydro bill. Now, Nelson can do this because we own our own hydro utility. You can put it onto your hydro bill and pay off that e-bike over the span of, of three to five years um, using, uh, you know, on your on your bill. And, and the idea there was not, there was a couple things, not just to um, get people onto e-bikes, but to create a more visible presence of climate action in the community, the more bikes you see around, the more pressure it puts on, on, the, on the other people to get their own e-bike and to consider getting out of their car and onto a bike. The other part of it though was, it was a first step into a home retrofit. The, the home retrofit was such a big step for people that we needed to create a ramp up to that. And the e-bikes was such a good ramp. And so not only did we great, get just outstanding adoption of the e-bike program, but it also pushed people into the home retrofit program too. It's once you start to identify as a climate actor, I am taking a step, it was easier for people to think about doing the harder things. So that's the kind of innovation and the successes that I think a city like Nelson can do. And then we can sh quickly share it with the rest of the country to adopt and, and other communities are adopting some of those programs. And we have, you know, the city of New Westminster, Victoria, Vancouver, all doing really interesting things that they're sharing through the network with other communities as well. I am still hoping to get an e-bike. I'm working on it. Um, I hope I don't have to move to Nelson to get it. Does anybody here have a question for our panel? Yes, principal. Actually, wanted to hear about the the Nestle compost uh, uh, issue, and also we've talked a little bit about uh, retrofit and 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 building. I wanted to get a sense of not only uh, what's uh, what's not getting done, or what what are the you know short of the large impediments, whether there are uh, ways in which the communication doesn't get done or you know i've always wanted to know what we used to do gender analysis for every policies that were you know to see what is the impact of yeah. you know not only are the 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 policies that were about women but all the other policies to see what would be the negative potential negative of invisible uh, uh impact on women do we do the same thing for climate like do we look at every policy not just the one that are part of the climate change plan but all policies to see what are their impact on, on, on climate. So that's, those are my two questions. I'd really like to know the compost story, but also uh, uh, this. Okay, Rick, uh, give us a, a quick update on, your, on the compost story. You were bi biking okay. around, picking stuff up, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, what we, we did was we looked at what were the, looked at the whole picture. What's the GHG profile of the composting in general? And one of the areas that doesn't often get talked about are the bins that need to contain the compost. You know, in, in BC, certainly in Nelson, we need bear proof bins. There's a lot of plastic. So the embodied carbon that goes into those bins is quite high. And interestingly, we saw almost a comparable GHG profile with something called like a food cycler, which is a dehydrator. It actually dehydrates the food. It, Right. And we're like, hmm, if we could dehydrate food in the, in this device, 
Um, we might be able to reduce pickups from weekly because that's the minimum that you would have to do a pickup to something more like say eight times a year. And also it's possible that by getting then, and also we'd also be able to compost more things. Uh, so we piloted the program and found that even the, the, the behavioral change that we saw using this device was much better than traditional composting because people found it more convenient. One, they didn't have to think about what goes in what, like the food cycler just takes everything. Um, so we and, reduced quite a bit of it in there. Yeah, yeah. and so basically it's, it's a device like this. You, you plug it in, you keep it in your kitchen, you put your wet waste in it and it cooks it and dries it and you end up with. Exactly. And it does it with a remarkably low amount of, of energy. And the the, bio, the product you get, they call it a, a soil supplement. You can rehydrate it and turn it back into traditional compost, or you can just add it directly to the garden and create this soil supplement. Um, and in that, so that program, we didn't know if it would work, but we, we tried it out and it seems to be working really well. So now we're going to scale it up across the city. And if that works, it's something certainly we're going to promote to the rest of the country as, as a viable solution to traditional composting. I, I just want to speak to the second question about um, how do you evaluate and decide on, on policy? Um, Climate Caucus has been working with the University of Victoria on this evaluation framework called the Planetary Health Framework. And it does look at the idea is that it takes every decision that comes before a council table and evaluates it across a number of, of factors, including social justice and the impacts it would have on the most vulnerable, um, uh, um, on the environment in particular, and, and so on. And so the idea is if we can empower counselors almost with an app or some tool that would be so easy to use that anything that comes before council can be put through this framework, then we can start to create a broader cultural change because staff knowing that this framework is going to be used by their council will then have to adopt the framework themselves and it could sort of cascade down to the, to the whole community. Dan, do you mind if I, I um, speak to the second question as well? Yeah, please do. Yeah, th thanks for the question. Well, thanks for asking about the compost program first, actually, because I've heard Rick mention it, but I didn't understand the, the detail around the, the countertop dehydrator. That's, uh, that is really innovative. Um, the, uh, so this is an excellent question about how you, how you integrate uh, or institutionalize uh, climate decision-making or a climate lens into decision-making across the municipal government or, or others order of government, frankly. There is a disconnect between climate targets and then even climate action plans and then decision. I mean, municipal council can, you know, uh, adopt a new climate plan in one meeting and then the next meeting, you know, uh, reject a zoning approval to increase density, uh, you know, uh, would be a classic example. And so there, there are, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, that approach is part of that, you know, municipal climate action 1.0 that I mentioned, where you, you hire a staff person and you set a target and you do a plan. And, um, and I think we're, you know, in our programming that we deliver to support municipalities, we're moving away from that model and more towards how do you integrate. And there's two, I think this is, it's an evolving, emerging kind of field of knowledge, but I think there are two, two ways of doing that that I, I want to point out uh, is, is procurement and, and how municipalities procure, especially construction services, but, but all goods and services, and how they can use more um, shift more towards performance based uh, procurement where the outcomes are written into the tender and it's not just lowest uh, cost uh, as as your as your primary uh, criterion for for evaluation that's one and then another which is you know a, a bit obscure if you're not kind of in the municipal world but is is asset management planning and Ontario actually is ahead on asset management in the sense that there's a, le a provincial legislative requirement for municipalities to do asset management planning but there aren't climate criteria built into that uh, legislative requirement. But uh, FCM delivers a program, has for a number of years, funded by Infrastructure Canada to build municipal capacity to do asset management planning better. Um, it, it's very simple, keeping track of the assets you have, understanding their age, their condition, their estimated useful life. Um, and there, there are very practical ways uh, and powerful ways to build climate considerations, both on the resilience side, what does this infrastructure need to withstand in terms of the climate of the future, where, where we 
we building it um, and, and how what standard are we building it to and what's going to be the cost of maintaining it as a result of climate change and also emissions reduction um, aspects that you can build in. Rick mentioned embodied carbon of a you know plastic uh, uh, you know uh, recycling bin. Well, imagine all the embodied carbon and all of the cement and concrete and, and, and steel uh, that we use to to build and maintain our cities. And and um, increasingly, um, the policy discussion around you know um, emissions from cities is looking at embodied carbon. And so, how do we build that into asset management planning? Um, and, and and how do we integrate that with land use planning? And so, we have a long way to go. But I think that's the direction I think we're 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 moving. It. Municipal governments are moving in, and, and I think um, in a good way. The federal government is very keen on on, on this, and 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 uh, keen on applying uh, a more fulsome climate lens to the infrastructure that they're you know spending federal uh, dollars on. At the same time that they've made climate uh, commitments, right? So I think that's uh, that's a really promising direction. And if I could just follow up on Matt's um, mention about kind of like climate change municipal action 1.0 as opposed to the one we're moving into, which is the 2.0. And in the previous kind of 1.0 climate change municipal action, it was always kind of like isolated. Climate change was isolated into the climate action plan. So it's like, okay, here's your climate action plan. Here's where your missions come from. Here's the actions you're going to undertake. And you're going to report on your progress on the implementation of this climate action plan. It didn't actually address the question of like, what about all the other municipal decisions, the transportation plan, the growth management plan, the stormwater plan? Does that actually bring climate change and does it in alignment with their climate emergency direct de declaration? The answer is no, that, that that climate change didn't move into all the other plans. And that is where the climate lens is kind of like climate change municipal action 2.0 is going. It's not just isolating climate change into its token plan. It's integrating the question of climate change into all municipal decision making. OK, so if I'm going to be kind of like as a counselor, kind of making a decision whether we install sidewalks on a community on a neighborhood street or not. The question then comes into it, how is this decision in front of me connected to climate or how is it going to be impacting climate or how is it going to be impacted by climate in terms of how much GNG, GHG emissions are going to be associated with this decision, how much risk or climate risk from extreme weather is going to be addressed in this decision. And that's the area that a lot of municipalities are moving into. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Can you can imagine like understanding not only do you need to do this in council, you need to do this through this through the throughout the staff in municipalities and into senior management to understand what is the connection between this decision I'm putting in front of council and how it's going to affect climate or be affected by climate. So there's a huge education, um, education opportunity and challenge ahead of us in bringing municipal staff and councils to understand the connection between this decision and climate implications. In addition, I would also say, it needs to create transparency. It can't just be done on the sly in terms of understanding. There needs to be a climate implication section in every single council report that addresses and helps to build that linkage between this decision and climate implications. And then also can create transparency so that we as re residents in our community can understand how municipal uh, councils are making their decisions and how they're factoring climate into their decision making. It's always good to have optimists on the panel. That'll that will be that'll be great. Um, any other questions? Okay, go ahead. So, um, Trevor says, "Great talk. Question for the panelists: Do you or your organization have a bias towards prevention versus mitigation strategies for climate change?" Uh, both deserve attention, but they measure success in different ways. It seems like prevention mainly only cares about absolute emission of CO2 or methane, whereas mitigation may care more about things like flood control and biodiversity. Thoughts on this? Okay, so I mean, for climate geeks who may be listening, the terminology in the climate world, mitigation is when we reduce our, our emissions, our pollution, and adaptation is how we cope with what happens after that. We certainly have to do both. Um, well, I mean, absolutely, we have to do both, as BC is showing, but I, I, I don't know. Um, Rick, do you want to take a crack at that? How do you balance how council spend, allocates its budget? It's so easy to have adaptation, just coping with the disasters, consume all the money so that we don't reduce our emissions, which means we accelerate the disasters. How do you balance that? 
But we've adopted a term called low carbon resilience, which combines those two together. Every decision we make at council has to address both of those factors. How does this make us more safe if we're given the future climate and how does it reduce our emissions? So we've, we've coupled those two things together and found that they couple together quite well, particularly in selling it to selling that initiative to the rest, to the city, to the electorate, to even to our staff. If, if some people hear that this is going to make us more safe, they're more likely to respond positively to it and others, if it helps us reduce our emissions, it does as well. So just as an example to that, one of the things that um, Johan Rockström um, spoke of at COP in sort of the preamble to the negotiations was how um, we are hitting or coming up against a number of tipping points. And one of those tipping points is related to wildfire. Mm -hmm. And that's something we, we, we feel very closely in the city of Nelson and in BC in general. And so anything that we can do as a city to protect ourselves from wildfire has the co-benefit of potentially um, reducing the emissions that are going to come from wildfire. Uh, so the, we've really tried to couple this as much as we can in, in everything we, we do and, and how we talk about it. Okay. Good to hear. Thank, thank you, Rick. Um, any other questions in the room? I know people are, time is running out. Uh, anybody else have a question? All right. Well, um, I, I think we're going to call it a close, though, because we're, we're starting to lose our audience. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Gabby, thank you very Rick, much. Matt. There's, there's a lot more we could talk about here, but I'm glad to hear some, some optimism, some reason for optimism, and that uh, progress is being made both on adaptation and, and on uh, reducing climate pollution. So thank you for your time, and, and uh, we're going to get a, an official thank you. Yes, um, thank you so much, Matt and Rick and Diane and Gabby and everyone here and everyone online for your questions and for the discussion. Um, I want to move to Nelson right now, so <laughs> I don't know what else to do, but I, um, that all sounds very inspiring. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, just a note, our next senior fellow luncheon, it's uh, going to be in January. It's hard to believe we're at the tail end of the fall semester already, but it is November the 23rd. So our next senior fellow luncheon is in January and our speaker is Payam Akhavan, who uh, you might know the name, I hope you know the name. He was our Massey lecturer in 2017. He's an international human rights lawyer and he's going to be talking about some of the enormous challenges right now in the international human rights landscape. So that's on January the 14th. Okay. So keep a look for that. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. Yeah. Thank you to our thank panelists. You. Yeah. And one last note, uh, if anybody wants to hear uh, more about uh, innovations like Food Cycler, they were one of the guests on my podcast, Green Economy Heroes, which you mentioned. So if you want some hope, you want to hear interviews with green business leaders like the people who have invented Food Cycler, they're for free. Okay. Green Economy Heroes, amazing innovators right across Canada. Thanks very much, everybody. Wonderful. And just um, a list, is there any way we can make a link to the podcast? Make it, that'd be great. Okay. Right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Really enjoyed it. Take care, guys. <laughs>